Welcome to Lecture 10 of BIB 102 New Testament Survey. Today's lecture is going to be finishing the Gospel of John. So let's get started. Letter B. Many teachings of Christ are unique to John. If you remember from where we left off in Letter A, we talked about the six miracles recorded in John that only he mentions. Now we're going to talk about some teachings of Christ that only John talks about. Number one is only John records Jesus' explanation of the new birth to Nicodemus. Now, as the Bible records, Nicodemus came to Jesus at night declaring that he knows that Jesus is controlled by God. Jesus replies that he must be born again. Nicodemus actually does not understand what he's talking about, so Jesus has to explain that he must be born both physically and then born spiritually. And he gives us that famous verse that we all love to talk to quote is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And without John recording this conversation, we would not have the, the record of Jesus declaring this to Nicodemus. Then, after this conversation with Nicodemus, he actually, in the same conversation, likens himself to Moses' serpent in the wilderness of Numbers 21, and says that just like Moses' serpent was lifted up in the wilderness, so shall the Son of Man be, which was obviously a prophecy and a prediction of his crucifixion. Now let's look at number two. Number two, only John records Jesus' offer of the water of life to a Samaritan woman. Now, if you remember from earlier lessons, the Jews did not have any dealings with Samaritans. And in fact, the only reason why they would ever go through Samaria directly is if they were in a hurry to get to either Judea or Galilee. Well, Jesus and his disciples travel through Samaria, and he sends his disciples to go get some food. Jesus, while alone, goes to this well, and there's a woman there. He asks her for some water to drink. She is completely shocked because the Jews had no dealings with Samaritans, so why would he be talking to her? Jesus responds that if he, she knew who he was, she would be asking him for water. Well, of course, he doesn't have a basin or anything to be able to get water with, so she just mockingly is like, oh, you have no way of getting us water. And then they get into this theological discussion on where they should worship. Should it be in Jerusalem? Should it be in Samaria? Where's the right place to worship? And Jesus points out that one day it will not matter where we worship because we will worship in spirit and in truth. Eventually, Jesus finally allows her to realize that he truly was the Messiah whenever she's on her way to leave and he says, oh, while you're leaving, when you come back, why don't you bring your husband? She replies, I don't have a husband. And Jesus points out, you're correct. You've actually been married five times, and the guy you're living with now is not even your husband. She immediately, immediately drops her basin of water, recognizes that he really is the Messiah, runs back to Samaria, tells all of her people in her town of a man who knows all that she's ever done, and the Bible records that many Samaritans became believers in Jesus because of her testimony. Interestingly, the disciples finally get back with food to be able to feed Jesus and the disciples, and they are shocked that he was talking to a Samaritan woman. Jesus replies that when it's time to harvest the field, you harvest the field. In other words, we don't look on a person's nationality or their gender or what to determine whether or not we will give them the gospel. Number three, only John records Jesus' upper room discourse. And if you remember from previous lectures, there's three main discourses that are recorded in the Gospels. The Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5-7, through the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24 and 25, and then here, the upper room discourse in Johns 13 through 17. Now, this one is definitely unique in the fact it's the very last discourse Jesus gives, and it's only to his disciples. In this discourse is when he teaches them about the coming of the Holy Spirit, he washes their feet, and he even reveals to them who the betrayer would be. Or not to all, but he does reveal to John. And then he ends in chapter 17 with what we call the Lord's Prayer. In chapter 17, Jesus prays for the Father to be glorified, he prays for his disciples, and he prays for all future believers who would come after the disciples, which is us. 
Continuing with number three is number four, only John records Jesus' washing of the disciples' feet. This took place in the Upper Room Discourse. And washing the feet was the job of a servant during this time. Jesus, in his washing the disciples' feet, displays his servanthood by kneeling down and using water and a towel to wash all twelve of the disciples' feet, which would mean including even Judas. However, when he gets to Peter, Peter refuses to allow Jesus to wash his feet, and Jesus replied that if he would not allow him to wash his feet, then Peter would have no part with him. Peter then, in response to that request, that Jesus basically wash his head and his feet. In other words, from head to toe, go ahead and do it. And Jesus replies, no, you've already been washed wholly, but you need your feet washed because of the cares and the wickedness of the world. Number five, only John records Jesus' giving of a new commandment. The old commandment was Leviticus 19.18, which says to love your neighbor as you love yourself, which we all would have to admit that is a very difficult command to obey because it, it elevates everyone to the same sacrificial love we would give to ourselves. But the new one takes it even a step further, as Jesus commonly would. In John 13.34, Jesus tells his disciples to love each other the way that Christ he loved them. And, of course, to us as well. We are supposed to love each other. We're supposed to love brothers and sisters in Christ the way Jesus loved us, which means even to the point where we would be willing to die for them. And lastly, number six, only John records Jesus' prayer to the Father. As I already mentioned in a previous slide, he prays for three things. He prays for his, himself to be glorified the, through the Father, which technically is just the Father to be glorified. Then secondly, he prays for his disciples. And then thirdly, he prays for all future believers. And specifically, when he prays for future believers, which is us, he prays for our unification and our eternal habitation with him in heaven. Now that we've talked about many teachings that are unique in the Gospel of John, let's look at letter C. Many aspects of Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection are unique to John. Number one, John records the most detail concerning Jesus' arrest and trial. Some of the things that only John records, and I'm just going to give you a few of them, is that John, only John records Judas betraying Jesus with a kiss. Only he mentions that. And then he records the most detail about Peter trying to prevent Jesus' arrest by cutting off Malchus's ear. And then exactly when Peter denied Jesus three times. Once when Jesus is on trial before Annas, the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest. And then two more times while Jesus is being interrogated by Caiaphas, the high priest himself. And then later in John, he mentions how Jesus was taken, delivered to Pilate, and then Pilate tried several times, six to be exact, to release Jesus, but they would not accept him. Instead, he even had to release a man named Barabbas instead of Jesus. Number two, John records the most detail concerning Jesus' beating, crucifixion, and burial. As I already mentioned, Pilate tried six times in these final chapters to release Jesus, but was not successful at all. This is actually when Jesus is scourged and mocked. And the scourging process is when an individual was tied to a post, stripped of their clothes, and whipped mercilessly, sometimes even with a device called a cat of nine tails, which was a whip with nine ends on it, where sometimes they would even tie fragments of glass and bone to tr completely shred apart the person who's being whipped. Jesus went through that scourging. And then... He is crucified as the king of kings. His clothes are divided, and then the care for his mother is delegated to John. Later, his death is even confirmed with a spear in his side, and he is buried in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. Number three, John records the most detail concerning Jesus' being missing from Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. In fact, we find out that Mary Magdalene was the first to discover that the tomb was empty. Though the synoptics tell us that other women were with her, John specifically mentions Mary Magdalene. And this actually caused her to run back and tell the disciples. Number four, 
only John records Jesus' appearance to Mary Magdalene. Now Mary is very distraught over this event because she believes someone has stolen her master's body. So she begins weeping. Then two angels actually try to console her and then Jesus appears, but she doesn't recognize him at first, which is possibly either because she was crying or maybe his appearance changed in some way. But again, in her mindset, she thinks Jesus is dead and his body has been stolen. So she wouldn't expect the person she's talking to to be Jesus. So she thinks he's a gardener and then ask him, does he know where Jesus' body was taken? He, Jesus speaks to her and then immediately she realizes it was Jesus. She runs to him, hugs him tightly, so tightly in fact that Jesus said that she had to let go because he had some business to do with his disciples and then one day when he got to the Father she could hug him as much as she wanted. Number five, only John records Jesus' appearance to all the disciples except Thomas and then his appearance to Thomas. So when, when Thomas was not with the disciples, for whatever reason, the Bible records that Jesus transported himself into the room where they were. And in fact, the first thing he says is, don't be afraid, because literally a person just appeared in the middle of the room. Then, after the disciples told Thomas what had happened, Thomas was skeptical. So when Jesus appeared, he said to prove that he really was who he says he was by touching his scars. Now the Bible does not record Thomas actually touching his scars. All it records is after Jesus said that, he immediately realized it truly was the Messiah. Number six, only John records Jesus' appearance to Peter, Thomas, James, and his brother John, and two other disciples while they are fishing. Now sometime after Jesus' resurrection, he appears to Peter, to Thomas, to James, his brother John and these two other disciples who are not named while they're fishing. We find out in this event that Peter is said to be, sh be fishing shirtless, and Jesus comes up to the shore and tells them to cast their nets to the right side. Peter, in true Peter form, says that they've been fishing all night and not gotten anything, but they will try it anyways. That's because it was common during this time to have a spotter on the shore who could see the movement of the fish and the schools of fish in the water and tell the fishermen where to cast their nets. When they start, they throw the cat, they cast their nets out, and when they pull their nets up, they notice such a multitude of fish, John actually counted 153, that they realize who the man is on the shore. It was Jesus. Peter then puts on a coat, jumps into the water, and swims to the shore while the others come up on the ship in dry land. When they get there, the Bible records that Jesus already had a meal ready for them. Number seven, only John records Jesus' challenge of Peter's commitment to him. This is that very famous story of when Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? In the English, we miss so much of it because it just seems like, do you love me? Yes, I love you. Do you love me? Yes, I love you. Do you love me? And then Peter is weeping and sad that he asked him the third time, do you love me? In the Greek is where you find the understanding to know why this is so significant. There are four different words in the Greek for love. Agape is unconditional, charitable love. Phileo is a friendship love. Storge is a familial love or family. And then eros love is that sexual love. Jesus asked him, do you agape me? Do you love me unconditionally? Peter replies, I phileo love you. I love you like a friend. Which, that is not what Jesus is asking. So then Jesus asked him a second time, Peter, do you agape me? Do you love me unconditionally? Peter replies, Lord, you know everything. You know I phileo you. I love you like a friend. And then lastly, Jesus has to change the verb a love that he uses. It says, Peter, do you phileo me? Do you love me like a friend? And that it grieved Peter, not that he asked him three times, but it grieved him because on the third time he asked him, do you love me like a friend? Phileo love. And Peter says, yes, you know, I love you like a friend. And this is when Jesus tells him he is going to change his occupation from a fisherman to a fisher, a shepherd of men. He also informs Peter of how he'll die. He'll tell, he tells him he will die 
crucified on a tree. And this actually causes Peter to inquire about John's death. So, well, if I'm going to die this way, what about John? How's he going to die? But Jesus basically says it's none of his business because he could allow him to live until his return if he wanted. But either way, it's not his concern. And number eight, and lastly, only John records your professor's favorite verse. John 21, verses 24 through 25 says, And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. Now, while John's gospel account is over 90% unique to the others, there is still so much more that Jesus did that John uses a hyperbole to say that we would not be able to have a library large enough or trees enough to cut down to make paper to write down everything that he did. Well, that brings us to the end of Lecture 10. I hope you enjoyed it. And the next lectures, we're going to be beginning in the Book of Acts. If you need anything or have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact me.